Today, we're going to look at lesson 12.1 day two on probability events. The essential question that we're going to continue to answer is how does describing events as mutually exclusive or independent affect how you find probabilities? Back in 12.1 day one, remember that we talked about mutually exclusive events and how to calculate their probability. Remember that mutually exclusive events are two events that cannot both happen at the same time. Today, we're gonna to focus on how to calculate probabilities for non-mutually exclusive events, as well as independent events. Calculating the probabilities of non-mutually exclusive events is a little bit different than calculating the probability of mutually exclusive events. Remember that mutually exclusive events are two events that cannot both happen at the same time. There's no possible overlap. Event A and B cannot happen at the same time. Well, when events are not mutually exclusive, that means there is overlap and the probability of A and B does not equal zero, meaning it's possible for A and B to both occur at the same time. So when you calculate the probability for non-mutually exclusive events, you use the formula probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. And what that does here at the very end, what you're doing for A and B, that's both. So what you're doing is you're subtracting the overlap. You're subtracting the center. If we didn't do that and we had just added it together, the probability of A, so I'm circling that in red, and then the probability of B, I'm circling that in blue. Notice how the red and the blue, if we were to count everything in the red and the blue, we would be counting that center section, the A and B that I'm coloring yellow, we'd be counting that twice. So for non-mutually exclusive events, you have to subtract the A and B. That way you're not double counting the overlap. So make sure you get that formula written down in your notes. Now let's look at an example for finding the probability of non-mutually exclusive events. There are 32 students in a class. Seven of the students are avid students and 10 are athletes. Four students are both avid students and athletes. So I'm gonna define these as events. I'm gonna let A be equal to an avid student. And athlete also starts with A, but I need to choose a different letter. So I'm gonna use the second letter in the word athlete, which is T, so T is equal to athlete. And what we're gonna do here for the first question is find the probability that a student is an athlete or an avid student. Because these events are non-mutually exclusive, we need to use the formula for the probability of two non-mutually exclusive events. Probability that a student is an athlete, athlete is T, or an avid student, avid student is A, is equal to, you add the two together, so probability of T plus the probability of A, and then we have to subtract the probability of A and T. So now let's go ahead and find our totals. And for our total, um, athletes, we are told that there are 10 athletes. So that's 10 athletes. And then avid students, there are seven students that are avid students. So that's seven. And then our overlap is four students are both avid and athlete. Now I know technically it is the probability. So all of these are over 32. And that 32 is just coming from the total number of students in the class. It tells us in that first sentence, there are 32 students in the class. So if we just go ahead and do 10 plus 7, which is 17, and then 17 minus 4 is 13, the probability that a student is an avid student or an athlete would be 13 out of 32. Now let's look at the probability that a student is neither an avid student or an athlete. For that, we can kind of use our answer to part A to help us with that. Remember that there are 32 total students. And if we're looking for neither avid students or athletes, we just need to subtract the number 13 that we just calculated above because there are 13 students that are either avid students or athletes. 
So if we do 32 minus 13, that leaves us with 19 students left over that are neither AVID students nor athletes. That means that there's a 19 out of 32 chance that you choose a student that is neither an AVID student or an athlete. Here's a try now, very similar to the problem that we just looked at here. This time though, we're talking about a shoe store. A shoe store made 51 sales today. 13 customers bought boots, 17 bought work shoes, and five customers bought both boots and work shoes. I want you to pause the video and try these three questions on your own. And when you hit play again, I'll have the answers and we'll talk them through. Ready, please pause the video. So the first question just asks for the probability that someone bought work shoes. Here, work shoes, there were 17 people that bought work shoes and the total sales was 51. So 17 out of 51 simplifies down to one third. For the second question, we need the probability that someone bought work shoes or boots. Because these events are non-mutually exclusive, we have that overlap of five customers buying both. You need to do probability of work shoes plus probability of boots minus the probability of the both. Here, I just added together my totals and then I put it over 51 at the end. So 17 work shoes, 13 boots, subtract the overlap of five that bought both and we get 25. For probability, just don't forget to put it into the fraction. So 25 out of 51. Finally, the last question, probability that someone bought neither work shoes or boots. You can use number two to help you. Remember there's 51 sales and we just figured out that 25 people bought either work shoes or boots. 51 minus 25 is 26. So there's 26 out of 51 chance that someone bought neither work shoes or boots. Next, we're gonna talk about calculating probabilities for both independent and dependent events. But before we can do that, we need to understand the difference between independent and dependent events. Events are independent if and only if one event happening does not affect the probability of another event happening. Examples of independent events would be rolling a die twice. When you have a die, which is just a six-sided number cube, whatever you roll on your first roll does not affect the roll on the second roll or the third roll. So those are independent events because one roll of the dice doesn't affect the probability of the next roll of the dice. If you're drawing items, whether it be cards or marbles or names, if you replace the cards after you draw them, that would be independent, but they must be replaced. So if I draw a card, I look at it and then I put it back into my stack and then draw again, the probability of the first event isn't gonna affect the probability of the second event. Dependent events are different. Events are dependent if one event happening affects the probability of another event happening. So our first event is going to affect our second event. An example of that would be drawing cards without replacement. If you don't replace the cards as you draw them, the first card, whatever that is, is going to affect the second card. For example, if I have five cards and then I draw my first card and I take it out and I don't put it back, now on my next draw, there's only four cards left. So the probability of that first event, whatever you drew first, is going to affect the probability of what you're drawing second. So that's your classic example for dependent events when you're drawing cards or marbles or drawing anything but not putting it back. Suppose we have a jar that contains 12 green marbles and eight violet marbles. A marble is chosen at random from the jar and replaced. Another marble is chosen at random from the jar. Does the color of the first marble chosen affect the possible outcomes for the second marble? The key word here is that you're drawing it and you're replacing it. You draw your first marble, you look at it, you put it back into the jar, and then you draw another marble from the same jar. Does the color of the first marble affect the outcomes for the second marble? Your answer here is no. It does not affect the outcomes because you put the first marble back. That means for your second marble, there's still gonna be 12 green marbles and eight violet marbles, so those outcomes are all still possible because we put the marble back. For this next one, suppose a marble is chosen at random from a jar 
and not replaced. Another marble is chosen at random from the jar. Does the color of the first marble chosen affect the possible outcomes for the second marble chosen? Well, your answer here is yes. Now there are only 19 marbles because you didn't put the first marble back. We started out with 20 marbles, 12 green and 8 violet, 12 plus 8 is 20. But if we're not replacing the first marble after we draw it, on our second draw, there's only 19 total marbles. So the probability is going to change. So that's the difference here between the um, independent and dependent events. Part A is an example of independent events. Because we're putting the marbles back, the probability of the second marble being drawn isn't going to change. But part B shows an example of dependent events because the total is changing every time you're not putting a marble back. Now that we know what independent events are, again, remember that independent events are just events where one event happening does not affect the probability of the next event. So if A and B are independent events, you calculate the probability of A and B by taking the probability of A times the probability of B. So notice here, this has the word and in it. And the word and, you're going to multiply. Remember with the or, we added. With and, we multiply. So if A and B are independent events, just take probability of the first event and multiply it by the probability of the second event. Now let's look at finding probabilities of independent events. Alex cannot decide which shirt to wear today, so he chooses one at random. He has two yellow shirts, one green shirt, and one purple shirt. The probability of rain today is 40% or two-fifths. What is the probability that Alex chooses a yellow shirt and it does not rain today? These two events are independent. The color of Alex's shirt does not affect whether or not it rains today. So because these events are independent, we can find the probability of choosing a yellow shirt or not raining by just taking those two separate probabilities and multiplying them together. So the probability that he picks a yellow shirt times the probability that it doesn't rain. So when it comes to these calculations, you can use either the percents, but you do need to switch them to decimals first, or you can use a fraction. So with Alex's shirts, let's just first look at how many total shirts he has. He has two yellow shirts, one green shirt, and one purple shirt. So two plus one plus one means he has four total shirts. So what is the probability that he picks a yellow shirt? Well, two out of four of his shirts are yellow. So two-fourths would be one-half. Then for probability that it does not rain, we have to be careful here because the probability that it rains is 40% or two-fifths. That means that if there's a 40% chance it rains, you have to think about the total percent is always 100. So 100 minus 40 would mean there's a 60% chance that it doesn't rain. And 60% is just the remaining fifth. So if two out of five chance that it rains, that leaves three, because two and three is five, there's a three-fifths chance that it does not rain. So here we could go ahead and just multiply this together. One half times three-fifths, you do one times three, which is three, and two times five is 10. So there would be a three out of 10 chance that he would choose a yellow shirt and it doesn't rain today. We can also do the same calculation using decimals, and that's actually probably easier to be honest. For a yellow shirt being two out of four or one half, if we convert that to a decimal, that's just 0.5. So what we could do is take 0.5 and then multiply that by 60%. Remember to get a percent to a decimal, you just move it over twice. 60% is 0 0.60. So if you go ahead and take your calculator and do 0.5 times 0.60, you would end up with 0.3 or 30%. So you get the same answer either way. 
The decimal might be easier, and in the next example, I'll show you how your calculator can convert between percents and decimals. Let's look at this last part here first. What is the probability that Alex chooses a green shirt and it rains? So here I'm gonna just save a little time by not writing it out. Probability that he chooses a green shirt. He only has one out of four green shirts. And it rains today. It rains today is a 40% chance. So I'm gonna stick with the percents here. So 40% chance that it rains. One fourth, I'm gonna switch that to a percent as well. One over four is 0.25 or 25%. Now, when it comes to doing these calculations, you do want to use the decimal. So 40%, I'm going to use 0 0.40. So 0 0.40, chance that it rains, and chooses the green shirt was 0.25. So we're going to take 0.25, that's the green shirt, and then 0 0.40 was the rain. And if we go ahead and take a calculator, 0.25 times 0.4 would be equal to 0.1. And 0.1, we could leave it like that, or we could switch it back to a percent, 10%. And if we wanted to switch that to a fraction, remember the percent is just a part of 100. So that means 10 out of 100, which simplifies to, if we divide by 10, one out of 10. Here's a try now, very similar to the last example. It does give us everything in percents here. So Aaron believes there's a 60% chance his bus drops him off at home on time and a 30% chance that his mom makes pasta for dinner. Because these are both given in percents, when it comes to making your calculations, why don't you switch the percents to a decimal and then you can leave your answer as both a decimal and a percent. You can skip the fraction part for this problem. So go ahead and pause the video and try this problem on your own. Pause the video, please. Before we do the calculations, we kind of need all of the percentages possible. So if there's a 60% chance his boss drops him off on time, that means there's a 40% chance it drops him off late. Remember, just take 100 minus 60 and that's 40%. Same thing with pasta. If there's a 30% chance his mom makes pasta, 100 minus 30 means there's a 70% chance she makes something else. So for the first question, what's the probability that Aaron gets home on time and doesn't get pasta? Probability that he's on time is 60%. Probability that she doesn't make pasta is 70%. Make sure to convert the percents to decimals before you put them in your calculator. 60% is 0.6, 70% is 0.7, when you multiply those together, you get 0.42, and that's 42%. Probability that he's late and she makes pasta for dinner would be 40% times 30%, so do 0.4 times 0.3, that's 0.12 or 12% for your final answer. For our last example, we're gonna look at the difference between calculating probabilities for objects when they're replaced versus when they're not replaced. And to do that, we're gonna talk about a standard deck of 52 cards. So cards are drawn at random from a standard deck of 52 cards and replaced. So in this first example, we're gonna put them back. What is the probability that you draw a red card? So probability that you draw a red card and then a seven. In a standard deck, half the cards are black and half the cards are red. So probability that we get a red card would be one out of two. And then getting a seven, well, in a standard deck, if you look here, I have the picture, there are four sevens out of the 52 cards. So now let's go ahead and just multiply that together. One times four is four two times 52 would be 104. And then you do want to simplify that fraction here. You can either simplify it by hand, or there is a way to simplify fractions on a graphing calculator or using Desmos. Simplifying it by hand, we'd just divide by four, and that would end up with one over 26. Sometimes though, it can be kind of tricky to simplify by hand. So here's how you can do it using technology. On a graphing calculator, to type the fraction, you just use the divide button. So one half, we would just type one, divide by two, and then times, 
and it was 4 out of 52, so 4 divided by 52. Hit enter, and your calculator is automatically going to give you the decimal. But to get it back to a fraction, you just hit the math button here, and then the first choice is frac. So hit enter, and then enter again. And that gives us the simplified fraction 1 over 26. To do this on Desmos, open a web browser and go to desmos.com and then click on the blue graphing calculator button. Once you do that, you're going to want to open up the calculator. So you can just click on this icon in the lower left corner there and that makes a calculator pop up. To get the fraction, you can use the divide key or you can use the slash button on your computer. So 1 divide by 2, and notice how that automatically makes my fraction, then multiplied by, and then it was 4 over 52. And notice the calculator gives us the decimal again, but to switch it back to a fraction, you just click over here on the fraction notation, and that gives you the simplified fraction of 1 over 26. So you're welcome to use either a graphing calculator or Desmos to help you simplify the fractions. For this next example, what's the probability that you draw an ace card and then without replacing it, so we're not gonna put the ace card back, you then draw a face card. Here, for an ace card, we know that the probability of getting an ace card, there are four different aces. And again, you can just look at this diagram if you're not sure about your cards. There's four different aces out of the 52. And then we're not replacing that ace. So on my second draw, now there are no longer 52 cards. Now there's only 51 cards, and we want to get a face card. A face card is a jack, a queen, or a king. So any of these cards over here are considered face cards. If we total that up, there are 12 different face cards. So 12 out of 51. Then go ahead and just multiply the numerators. 4 times 12 is equal to 48. And 52 times 51 is 2,652. We do want to simplify that. And here's where having that calculator is really going to be helpful. So I'm using the math fraction button on my calculator. You can go ahead and use the Desmos fraction as well. And that's going to simplify down to 4 out of 221. So that probability was an example of a dependent event. So notice how my second probability, it changed now. The total was no longer 52 cards. Since we didn't replace the first card, now there's 51. So really look at the wording when it comes to drawing objects. What is the probability that you draw the three of hearts and then without replacing it, you then draw a queen? So again, I'm not going to put the first card back. This time, though, it's not just drawing a three. It's drawing a three of hearts. And there's only one three of hearts. There's four total threes, but only one of them has hearts as a suit. So that's one out of 52 chance that you draw a three, out of heart, a three of hearts. Then we're not going to put it back. So now my total on my second card is now 51. And then we're looking at drawing a queen. There are four queens in the deck. We haven't taken away any of the queens, so that's four. And now when we simplify that again, we do one times four, so four. 52 times 51 is 2,652. And then go ahead and just put that in your calculator or Desmos to help you simplify the fraction. And when I do that, I'm getting one out of 663. All right, now let's say we draw three cards at random and replace each card after you draw it. So this time we are gonna put them back. What is the probability that you draw a nine, then a black card, and then a face card? So drawing a nine, there are four out of 52 cards that are nines. Then you draw a black card. So then a black card, again, half the cards are black, so one over two. You could also do 26 out of 52 if you want. And then drawing a face card. The face card, again, was any jack, queen, or king, so there were 12 out of the 52. Then, just take your calculator and multiply the numerators together. 4 times 1 times 12 is 48. For my denominator, 52 times 2 times 52 is equal to 5,408, or 408. And then I'm going to use my calculator or Desmos to help me simplify that fraction. 
And when we reduce that fraction, we end up getting 3 out of 338. So that's about as hard as it can get when we look at drawing objects with or without replacing them. Pay really careful attention to whether or not the objects are being replaced because that's going to change the probability on the second one. If you're not putting a card back, your total is going down. If you are putting them back, like we were in this example, notice how everything stayed 52. I just for black cards or red cards, it's just easier to do one out of two. Um, you could also have done 26 out of 52, and that would have worked the same, and we would have still gotten the same answer after we simplify it. Here's our final example. It's a try now, and I want you to try this problem on your own. Go ahead and pause the video, please. Ready? Pause the video. So here are your answers. The first thing I did was just total up how many marbles we have. 12 plus 8 is 20 marbles. Probability that you draw a green marble replace it, and then another green would be 12 out of 20 times 12 out of 20. That simplifies down to 9 out of 25. For the second one, probability you draw a purple marble would be 8 out of 20. Then without replacing it, now we're down to 19 marbles. You draw a green, 12 of them are green, but there's only 19 total because we didn't put the first one back. Multiply those two fractions together and we end up with 24 out of 95 as our final answer. So that's it for Lesson 12.1 Day 2. Thanks for watching. Bye.